Hello everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Phillips and I'm a PhD student at Murdoch University under the primary supervision of Dr. Wei Zhu and today I'd like to talk to you about my PhD project, Chemical Cues Used by Natural Enemies of the Green Peach Aphid to Locate Their Prey in Canola Fields and show you some of my results. Uh, the green peach aphid is a highly polyphagous uh, pest of many plants. It attacks over 400 species of plants in 40 different families and is a serious pest of about 100 of them, including canola, my plant of interest. It reproduces pathogenically, which means it basically clones itself. And each female is born pregnant with 20 plus um, females within her, at least in temperate climates. And this leads to very rapid exponential growth, which obviously due to their feeding habits or being sap suckers, they can uh, cause damage to plants by depriving them of nutrients. However, the green peach aphid causes most of its damage uh, by being a vector of several diseases. Here in uh, Southwest Western Australia, the turnip yellows virus is an example of a serious disease of canola. So how do we control green peach aphid? Historically, we've used insecticides. However, the green peach aphid is one of the most insecticide resistant insects in the world and definitely uh, the most insecticide resistant aphid out there. Um, and here in WA, we only have two um, chemicals that are registered for use against green peach aphid in canola. And in 2017, both of them failed. So we need alternatives. Um, and one of those alternatives, obviously, is biological control, using natural enemies to control our pests. However, in broad acre contexts, such as canola, it's, there's a variable efficacy, like it doesn't always work. Um, and I know these last two years, last year, farmers had to spray, whereas this year, I know one farmer didn't spray at all. So how can we improve biological control? Um, well, basically, can we get the we need to get the natural enemies into the field earlier? Because typically, what happens is the aphid population booms due to their rapid cloning of themselves, and then the natural enemies arrive, and the damage is done. And in fact, ladybird beetles are considered by many farmers as a nuisance later in the season as they're trying to harvest. They gunk up machinery and whatnot. So, how do we get these natural enemies into the field earlier so they actually do the work we need them to do? One of them, one method could be mass release. That's augmentative biological control, where we just release, mass release them into the field. We could lure them into the field using baits and artificial diet, or we could use a combination of both. And then we also want to encourage the natural enemies to stay because most natural enemies in their adult phase, at least, are actually quite highly mobile, ladybird beetles and hoverflies as an example. So how do we achieve this? One way could be semiochemicals, which are chemicals that convey a message between, an organ, between one organism to another, whether it's between the same species or to a different species. So my aim is to see if we can improve biological control by identifying semiochemicals which attract natural enemies and retain these natural enemies in the field. Therefore, my specific objectives are one, to ID, to identify the natural enemies of green peach aphid in canola fields in the wheat belt region of Western Australia. Two, to identify the semiochemical volatiles released by healthy canola, canola attacked by green peach aphid, and then released by green peach aphids alone. Then three, the electrophysiological response of these natural enemies to the volatiles released by canola and aphids, and finally, the behavioural responses of the natural enemies to these same volatiles. Some results. So this is my natural enemy survey. So an east-west transect, uh, as far west as Clackline on the left there, and uh, Muntagen on the right there. And then I went as far south as Brookton and as far north as Watercarron. And on the left there is a picture of me frolicking in a canola field in Clackline this year. So my results, which are incomplete, I haven't finished sorting out all my samples, but the most common natural enemy by far were parasitoid wasps. And that's a Dieterella rapae up the top there. Not, a, not the greatest uh, photo, but it's what I have. Um, hoverflies were the next most common and they were the most common predator. And that's another one on the bottom there. 
And then I also found ladybird beetles, lacewings and spiders in the fields. Uh, Coccinella transversalis was the most common ladybird beetle and I found green and brown lacewings. And here's just a, <coughs> sorry, a uh, graph of my incomplete results, but you can see that the parasitoid wasps. So this is to order. So this does include ants and bees, but by far the greatest number of uh, Hymenoptera were parasitoid wasps and the diptera in yellow there, you can see just far below and that doesn't include all the natural enemies. So that includes ordinary flies you just find and fruit flies and whatnot, but surfidae are in there, the hover flies. So next I've tested the electrophysiological responses of natural enemies to volatiles using electroantennography, where I excise heads or antennae, depending on the size of the antennae, and I place the head between two electrodes and run an electrical current through that. I then expose the antennae to volatiles. And if the receptors within the antennae bind to the volatile, this changes the voltage of the uh, electrical current, which can be measured and output into graphs. So here are two graphs uh, examples. So on the left, we have eugenol, which does not get a significantly strong response from uh, WASP in this case. And this is the same individual I've used here. Whereas on the right, we have two heptanone, which is a very common volatile found across many different species. And we get a nice um, dip there. Um, wasps, uh, I prefer working with hoverflies. They have a much cleaner graph. Wasps are uh, very noisy, as you can see. So these are more uh, box plots up the top. 11, numbers 11 and 12 are my blanks, so blank and my solvent, diethyl ether. And here we see there are three significantly different, uh, three significantly uh, um, responses of uh, the wasp to chemicals. So number seven is 2-heptanone. Number four here is um, cis-3-hexan-1-ol, and number two is cis 3 hexanol acetate. So those showed significant responses compared to uh, the controls. So here are the chemicals that showed significant responses. Uh, the WASP one is smaller because I simply haven't tested them to these extra ones that you see with the hoverflies. And that's due to um, chemical uh, so logistic problems due to the pandemic and that my chemicals are coming in piecemeal. So um, I just, I need to go back and test the WASPs against these new ones. But um, most of these chemicals are well-known uh, green leaf volatiles that have been shown to be attractive to um, uh, natural enemies in the past and 2-heptanone which is a very interesting one because that is depending on which group of insects you're dealing with can have different results um, so in the hymenoptera it's actually an alarm pheromone among bees and wasps and ants sorry whereas mediterranean fruit fly has been found to be attracted to 2-heptanone so i'm very excited to explore that one a bit further so conclusions Several chemicals show promise as potential candidates for attracting natural enemies into the field earlier, especially the green leaf volatiles. And when I started this project, I expected to come out team wasp or team ladybird beetle, but I've ended up on team hoverfly. And I believe they're an excellent candidate for future research due to their double beneficial role as pollinators, as adults and biological control agents as their larvae are voracious predators of aphids. So future plans. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I've had to do my research basically in reverse. I originally planned to do the volatile analysis first and then use that as a guide for my behavioral and electrophysiological research. But due to the pandemic and uh, logistic problems, I've had to go, uh, all my chemicals have been selected from literature basically. More EAG, I want to, as I said, because of these logistic problems, there are some chemicals I've ordered that I still haven't got. Um, so I'll do on the wasps and the hoverflies further research, as well as expanding my list of um, insects. For example, this Coccinella transversalis here. So I want to add them to my EAG experiments. I've got one more field survey planned for next year. Uh, again, just an east-west transect, hopefully across six sites. And then behavioral experiments. So this is very important because a limitation of EAG is that it shows you that the insect is responding to the um, 
volatile and it's picking it up, but it doesn't tell you what that response is. So for example, the Hymenoptera, bees and ants, it's an alarm pheromone. So I, you would hypothesize maybe that my parasitoid wasps would be repelled by it. Whereas the Mediterranean fruit fly, which is the same order, Diptera, as my hoverflies are attracted to it. So I'd hypothesize potentially that my hoverflies are actually attracted to, to, uh, to heptanone. So that will, by these behavioral experiments, that will guide whether or not these um, volatiles are actually suitable for use as lures in the field. I'd uh, just like to acknowledge um, GRDC and Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development who funded this project, as well as Murdoch University and my supervisors who have supported me in this project and all my family and friends and fellow PhD students who have helped me along the way and supported me. Thank you. Very good, thanks Andrew. Uh, a very thought provoking presentation. Uh, I'll open things up for questions. We've just got a minute or two and I think we'll go to Vesna first. Uh, are you going to test these chemicals in the field to see if they increase biocontrol of aphids, reduce aphid abundancies? That would be um, future work. Um, at the moment, this is sort of, I guess, blue sky, and I'm just looking like, what what is attracting these um, these natural enemies? And then, I guess, a follow on to my project would be, do they actually re increase biocontrol of aphids? So that that's be next steps beyond my uh, PhD. Nice, concise answer. Thank you, Andrew. Let's uh, squeeze in a quick one from Onyeka. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. That's um, a very good presentation. I'm, I'm sort of interested in this uh, chemical uh, biocontrol sort of thing because coming from pollination, I'm looking at ways we can attract pollinators to the crop uh, so they can pollinate the crop. So that's what I'm sort of asking. Um, the way you tested the chemicals, is there other ways from your literature search that we can use to sort of uh, draw the chemicals and be able to tell which chemical, or do you just have to test several chemicals and then decide this is the real one? Sort of lost there. Um, yeah, there are, so behavioral tests, I think, give you the most information. EAG, I guess, is sort of screening, like which chemicals have uh, recepted or, or not, you know, uh, they pick up and then, but I think behavioral tests are the best one and there are different ways. There's Y-tube and there's wind tunnel. And there's, uh, I think those are a couple I might be doing later on um, with another PhD student of ways. Um, but yeah, I think behavior is the best one. Um, and one thing you have to realize often is like, I'm doing one chemical at a time, but sometimes that doesn't tell you the whole context because often plants, when they're attacked, they will change their volatile quantities, but they won't produce a new one or anything. So um, there's a lot of nuance, I guess, in interpreting these results. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, well, that'll have to do for now, Andrew and Onyeka. Sorry, because uh, time is against us. Indeed, there are more questions in the chat box from Catherine and Ari. Uh, Andrew, you, you might want to have a go at replying to those in the chat box, but don't worry too much because there'll be plenty of time at the end of the session today for a panel discussion, and I'm sure we can circle back to Ari and Catherine then. Thank you. Right, so um, I'll get into trouble, even more trouble than usual if I don't uh, keep to time. So we'll go on to our next speaker, and that's 